Ladies and gentlemen, I'm about to introduce you to something so rare, many people of my age doubt its very existence. I'm about to introduce you to something that has never before been seen outside of New Zealand since the 1950s. This is a newspaper. Uh, and in it, there's quite an interesting article uh, about the latest gender pay gap report in the UK. Now, as most of you might assume, it continues to show a distinct bias towards the male gender. That's been the trend for many years now, and we can't see that changing within at least the next decade. But the thing that really caught my eye is that at the Commission for Social Equality and Human Rights, Women are paid more than men by 8.2%. Now, many of you might ask, surely it's hypocritical that a commission designed to promote equality pays any gender more than the other. But the interesting thing that got me thinking about this is that it's not the only gender pay gap statistic that posts the general trend we see. For the first time ever, women between the age of 22 and 29 earn more than men of the same age category. And since 2010, uh, between 2010 and 2016, the gender pay gap fell by over 12 percent. So, I guess, just before I go on, uh, I'd like to run a quick poll. Who here would classify themselves as a feminist? Anyone? Someone? No? Okay, we've got a few. Um, okay, I quite frankly agree. Equality is one of the most basic things that we can demand a government provides for us. Uh, so it might seem a tiny bit strange when I argue that sex is no longer a barrier to social progress. Now, obviously sex can still exist, as has been demonstrated by the fact that we still have a gender of pay gap. But can we really argue that something stops us from achieving quality if all the statistics surrounding it indicate that it's getting better and better or shorter or, 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 or getting smaller year on year? Now, if we walk through the history of human civilization, we will inevitably come to the conclusion that there have been four major values of social progress. Sexism, racism, homophobia, and class. Now, as I was talking before, I'm not going to bring up those uh, gender pay gap statistics again, because I think they speak for themselves, and, and they speak volumes. But I'm going to ask, can we really argue that sexism is the biggest barrier to social progress when all statistics indicate that it's on the down. Cases of homophobia in the US and UK combined are at an all time low, and same sex marriage is available to more people than ever before. So, can we really justifiably argue that sexism and homophobia continue to be the biggest social barriers to equality? Now, the reason why we often think, and why it could be a tiny bit controversial, the reason why we think that these are the greatest barriers to social progress is the fact that the politicians and celebrities that are in the public eye enjoy standing up for photo ops in front of the private way, or going for a sit down with some feminist group, because it is generally good press. And it's for these reasons, because those in the public eye have drawn such attention to it, that it has been admitted to today in Zeitgeist that these are the key issues we face. In other words, we believe these to be the biggest frontiers to social equality because those in the public eye wish that to be believed. Now, race is a difficult one, not least because it's based on such an arbitrary concept. So, putting this as diplomatically as possible, race, whilst a component part is not the core barrier to the progression of equality on a social, on a social scale. So, in the United States, for example, those who attend university are overwhelmingly likely to come from upper or middle class backgrounds. No matter what race or religion or nationality you follow in the US, if you have a university degree, you are three times less likely to fall under the poverty line in the future than those that don't. The distinguishing variable here is not the race of that individual, it's the education level, and by extension, likely to be the class to which they belong. 
So we presented this idea that because there is such an overlap between race and class, it's often hard to tell the gray from the black. Um, and on top of this, we're also prevent, uh, presented in a situation, unfortunately, where in many Western nations, ethnic minorities tend to make up the working class compared with the majority of their country. Uh, in the US, again, for example, African Americans uh, earn on average about $6,000 less a year than the average uh, white person. Uh, poverty rates among white populists, again, in the United States, is on the 9.9%. Compare that to Latinos, where it's 23.2%, and for blacks, an amazing 25.8%. Uh, so we presented with a situation where there's a huge overlap between race and class. So when we see the race divisions worsening, we can also see the class divisions worsening. Class and race are uh, correlational relationship. Now, obviously, by this point, we've probably come to the conclusion, as I have, that if it can't be sexism, homophobia, or racism, then it has to be class is the only thing by which we still divide ourselves. Now, quite frankly, it's, uh, since 1976, the share of wealth of the top 1% has almost doubled. Now, I know this is quite a cliche fact when it comes to giving any talk or any speech, but it really is the best way we have of measuring that class divide. Despite the efforts of governments around the world to increase the earnings of unprivileged people or to provide opportunities, for those who classically be profiled as working class, the divide still exists. Just as 1800s, and the most, the most astonishing part of this for me is that society that has embraced capitalism, we've embraced this class divide. Just as 1800s America accepted and legitimized racism, we in one day have accepted and legitimized classism when it comes to a legitimate method of discriminating against people. Now, what is even the problem? It's not like in a capitalist society, the quality, quality of life and happiness of all the sold as commodities. It's not like the overwhelming majority of decisions made by or for us are on the basis of the financial assets we possess. I mean, it's absurd to think that governments, corporations, and other revenue generating bodies care about wealth and money. That's an absurd idea that no civilization would ever earn money. Now, of course, it is a huge problem. And for all of the reasons that I've just mentioned, class and wealth define so much of what we have access to. It dictates how our relationship with bodies that dominate our society happens. It dictates how we perceive abstract ideas like freedom, liberty, and power. As the Americans would put it, wealth is the means by which we attain life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. And having wealth concentrated among such a small part of society deprives us of the chance, deprives the overwhelming majority of people of the chance to achieve those most basic social goals. Now, a couple of weeks ago, at Harter, I went home to the UK. Uh, and I sat and had a debate, probably more of an argument, with my grandmother over class divisions in the UK. Now, like many people of a certain age, she comes to the conclusion that there were hundreds of thousands of people in the UK sitting on their sofas, receiving benefits, not because they couldn't work, but because they didn't want to. As you might assume, I didn't agree. Um, but then what she started arguing was that the way to solve this labour crisis was to force people into work, uh, into community service, part-time. Uh, and at that point, the argument had shifted from class morality, uh, class differences and moralities, to class division and its solutions. Luckily, I have a solution. Um, and no, it isn't a workers' revolution or rising and staging a coup against the bourgeoisie. No, it's something quite simple. When it comes to talks on this subject matter, people often advocate for a complex system of, of uh, universal basic income or wealth redistribution. But what we've got to do is much simpler than that. Change the way by which we attain 
life that teaches you happiness. I'm not arguing for full abolition of the monetary system, I think that is completely absurd. You have to assume that full abolition of a capitalist society would be unachievable in today's, uh, uh, in today, I mean, uh, by today's standards. So what we have to do is we have to rethink it. Given the fact that wealth is concentrated, uh, the class is the only remaining barrier to social progress, given the fact that wealth is concentrated amongst those upper classes, we have to assume that it's impossible for lower class people to achieve power, life, liberty, freedom, all of these things. So simple, just rethink the way that we approach that divide. Rethink the way we attain life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Change how we unlock power, how we unlock liberty. What we need to do is we need to rethink, alter any synonym of these. Rethink how we approach that final frontier. Thank you.